Uh, let's pray before we begin. Um, Father, we want to thank you, God, for the gift of this a new day, the gift of Sunday, the gift of Sabbath, the gift of coming together to worship you, Lord, the gift of coming to you to listen to your voice so that you would teach us from your word, so that we would walk in your truth, we would walk in your ways, so that, uh, God, we would be able to see what only you can do in and through our lives, God. You're a big God. You're a great God. And you want to do great things with us, in us, through us, God. What an amazing thing that the God who created the universe would design will that he would partner with us to see your kingdom come, to see your will being done on this earth, oh God. We want to thank you that, Lord, when we surrender our lives to you, when we walk with you, God, in humility, Father, depending on you, Lord, the God who makes the impossible possible helps us to see impossible things become possible in our lives, God. And so we thank you, God, for this time. God, speak to us. We pray that, Lord, you would open our eyes to see what you want us to see, how you want us to see things. So many times we just casually, Lord, glance over things, overlook things, God, according to our sinful convenience. Let that not happen, God. We don't want to walk in carelessness. We don't want to live superficial lives. Lord, we want to be honest. We want to be sincere in our faith. We want to be wholehearted in our devotion to you, in our obedience to you. We want to be wholehearted in our desire, God, to live for you, to live abiding in you every day, God, to live for your glory. And so, God, we, we understand how immensely important this topic is. And we pray that you would speak to us today and uh, bring, uh, Lord, a turning back towards you, a returning to you, God. Lord, a correction, a disciplining. And we thank you that you do so because you love us. We know, God, that if you didn't love us, you would not care about us. You would not be concerned. You would be indifferent. But Lord, it is your love that causes you, God, to discipline us for our benefit so that we could partake of your holiness, so that we would be able to see you do what only you can do in our lives, God. So we commit ourselves into your hands. And we say, Lord, come deal with us. Come speak to us. Come correct us, counsel us, encourage us, strengthen us where we are weak. And God, help us uh, to be where you want us to be, to become the people you want us to become, to do the things that you want us to do, God. And so we commit this time into your hands. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. And all the people said, even online, amen. Uh, last Sunday, I spoke about why we should pray. Immensely important message. And uh, as I spoke about uh, this message, I've, as, I, as I told you the last time, I've just been sensing uh, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, the great need for us to grow in prayer, for us to be a prayerful people. You know, as uh, we looked at the message last week on why we pray, uh, we looked at how prayer is a key dynamic in our relationship with God. You know, God is a God who's made a covenant relationship with us, not a contract, not a superficial agreement or understanding, but a covenant relationship, the highest form of a relationship. And he said, I will be their God and they shall be my people. You know, I will write my laws upon their heart, engrave it upon their hearts. I'll put my law into their minds, you know, and we see that the sweetest thing about this beautiful meeting you know, in this beautiful relationship that God has brought us into by the sacrifice of his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is we have the gift of prayer and fellowship with God and, and uh, you know, asking of him and him hearing us. And he, we ask and he listens. We ask and he answers. And that's how beautiful, uh, you know, this relationship. And, and, and we understand that prayer is therefore a key dynamic of our relationship with God. You know, Jesus himself prayed. He did nothing on this earth without first asking the Father. The Gospels record for us that Jesus said, I only speak what I hear my Father speak. Where would he hear the Father speak? In his time of communion with the Father. I only do what I see the Father do. Where would Jesus see the Father do? When he would be in communion with the Father. And may we imitate Jesus because that's what we're commanded to do. You know, let us hear the Father and speak. Let us see the Father and do. Let us hear Jesus and imitate him. And we also saw that how prayer is the evidence of humility. It is pride that causes people to be independent of God, to live the lives the way they wanted on their terms. 
But humility says, God, I need you. I know I can do a lot of things without you, but it will be of no eternal value. And so, God, I, I want to come to you. I want to surrender my life to you. I don't want to live my life independent of you. I want to live my life depending on you. And so prayer is an ask of depending. Prayer, prayer, prayer is, is an expression of dependence. Prayer is an expression of humility. We also saw how we cannot live this Christian life on our own. You know, the Christian life, as God commands us, it is not a difficult life. It is an impossible life. It is impossible to live the way God commands us to live, the way he expects us to live. It is impossible to see the promises and the plans and the purposes of God fulfilled in our life in our own strength. This is just ridiculously impossible. And so what, we are, what God commands us is that come to me in prayer and allow me to manifest my life in you and through you. Allow me to manifest my power in you and through you. Because the kingdom of God is not in word, it is in power. And that power is, is appropriated, is absorbed, appropriated, and activated when we become a prayerful people. A life without prayer would be barren and fruitless. And lastly, I also mentioned about how the great reward of prayer is God himself. And isn't that the most beautiful thing? The great reward of prayer is not just the prayers that we get answered. You know, we have our prayer list and prayer points. And I absolutely don't devalue that. I have my prayer points that I pray almost every day. You know, I cover various aspects of my life. I try to cover almost all the aspects and responsibilities of my life. But even as we do that, what we, what we begin to experience that the greatest joy of being in prayer is not just the prayers being answered. That is joy. Jesus himself said, when you ask of the Father in my name, believing, you will receive it so that your joy will be full. But the greatest uh, level of joy is communion with the Lord, is the Lord himself. That Because in the place of prayer, in the secret place, we experience the love and the presence of the Father. That is the greatest reward of prayer. Today, I want to take it deeper. And um, what I want to do is I want to... Um, talk very clearly, very honestly, very openly about the greatest weakness and the greatest challenge we face as a people of God. And I want to say it for what it is. It is the sin of prayerlessness. The sin of prayerlessness. And I believe, beloved, that even as I say this and even as I'm going to speak about this, you know, one is that I'm going to be speaking even about. But I want to say this as I say this, I'm praying and believing that the Holy Spirit will make itself, will make your families, will make my family, will make us individually houses of prayer. And so I believe that for us to come there, and it's not a very long journey. It's not a long journey to become a house of prayer. You and I can become a prayerful people starting from today, starting from now. But I believe that it is important for Jesus to cleanse his temple. It's important for Jesus to cleanse our hearts and our lives. It's important for Jesus to cleanse our families, to cleanse our life groups, to cleanse every, his temple because we belong to him. He is our Lord. And so the first thing is when I say that, that the sin of prayerlessness, I don't want you to put up a wall of defense. We say, oh, you know, my understanding of grace is that the Holy Spirit doesn't convict me. You know, whatever we have in the theology of things. Beloved, you know, conviction is not a bad word. Correction is not a bad word, you know. Um, just some time back, I was uh, listening to Paul Washer talk about the way in which God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. You know, you, 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 you remember that in the book of Romans chapter 9. And scripture records for us and says, Jacob, I have loved and Esau, I've hated. And it's, it's a scary thing. Because when you look at those two lives, you will see actually J Jacob go through all these difficult challenges in his life. And you see, you know, whether you look at Jacob or I just hop right now for a moment, you look at life with Joseph and the Lord was with Joseph. But look at the kind of things that Joseph went through. Just hardship after hardship. Some stuff was heartbreaking. You know, but we see that God was actually preparing Joseph for what he had prepared and purposed for his life. And we see that in the life of Jacob, you know, that finally the climax was when God wrestled with Jacob and changed his name to Israel to be prince with God. And we see finally how God blessed Jacob, you know, that till today the people are called the people of Israel. <laughs> they call after his name, you know. And, and we see that, you know, we are, we then in, in, the, in the entirety, we see how 
God um, loved on Jacob, you know, and truly loved him. He pursued him, disciplined it, broke his bone literally, uh, you know, and uh, loved him and changed his name, changed his destiny and made of him a great nation, fulfilling the promise that he gave his grandfather, Abraham. How did God hate Esau? How did God hate this Esau? Because when you look at the life of Esau, the Bible says he, he was a great company. He became famous. He had a lot of livestock. He was a very wealthy man. He had a great army, so great and so fierce that Jacob actually feared meeting Esau because his company was greater. If, if, if God allowed Esau to become so great and so prosperous, in what way did God hate Esau? Here's the scary thing. He allowed Esau to do what he wanted to do. God was indifferent to him. Many times God's hatred is not as active judgment and wrath. Here's the scary thing. God's hatred for a person would be God's absolute indifference to that person. You can live how you want. You can do how you want. But you're going to be eternally doomed. <laughs> Beloved. I don't want God to do that to me. I don't want God to be indifferent with me and you. I don't want God to be indifferent to our families. In his great love for us, the book of Hebrews says very clearly, God disciplines whom he loves. God's going to come after you because you're his child. You tell me, will you discipline the child of your neighbor? Will you go after the kids who are on the other side of the road who are living on the other side of the building and the apartments? Would you go after the kids? No, why? Because they're not your kids. But your own child and your own daughter, when you need to, you will pick up the rod. You raise your voice. You, you make it difficult for them when you know that they're doing things that are wrong or they're not understanding what is the right thing to do. You're going to go after your child. You're going to pray for your child. You're going to correct your child. You're going to discipline your child. You're going to give them time out. You're going to have talks with them. If need be, you're going to remove the rod and give the spanking. That the Bible says to drive out the foolishness that's bound up in the, in the, in the heart and the mind of the child. Why? Because it's your child and because you and I are the child of God, expect the rod to come. Expect the dealings of God and don't resist it. Receive it. Let God drive out the foolishness that's in us. And let him make you and me the people that he wants us to be. He wants us to be a house of prayer. He wants us to be a prayerful people, a covenant people. I will be their God and they will be my people, a covenant people are a praying people, a seeking God people, a worshipping people, a people who listen to his voice and obey him. That's the evidence that you are a covenant child of God, that your family is in this covenant. And so I want to speak very clearly, beloved, on the sin of prayerlessness. And this is not a perfect man who's speaking to you. I thank God that in his grace, much of my Christian life, God has helped me to value at very early, at the very start, the value of spiritual disciplines, you know. And I'm, I'm so grateful that we had none of the hyper-grace doctrines at that time and teachings at that time. And I didn't hear from anybody. Anybody tells me that, oh, you, if you got to pray every day, you got to read your Bible every day. That, that I had nobody tell me that junk. When I understood that if I love God, I hunger for him. I thirst for him, which I had. He put a deep, deep hunger for me. The way I give expression to that hunger is that I read his word voraciously. I sought his face in prayer. I sought and delighted in his presence and through worship. And, I, 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 and that's how God helped me to grow in him in leaps and bounds. And I look at much of my Christian life that God helped me to value spiritual disciplines. And though there were so many difficult things, I, I went through in my life, difficult seasons of my life, in life, in family, in ministry, went through a lot of stuff in ministry. You know, some people today find it so easy to hop churches. You know, I had so many reasons to hop churches. When a man of my level of leadership, I could have easily hopped. But I, but I knew that was the wrong thing to do. And it's because of those spiritual disciplines that I was able to experience the dealings of God in my life. Things don't change by hopping. The grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is always greener where you, where you water it or where you allow your good shepherd to water in your life. You stay in the land and you be faithful. And all that happened through spiritual disciplines, especially the discipline of the prayer and the word and you know, fasting at least once a week and, 
and you know what I went through in, in the last two, two, three years, you know, but God helped me to cling to him through the word, through prayer. And I want to say this to you, beloved, that, you know, the greatest gift that God has given you after salvation, the greatest gift is the gift of communion, is the gift of fellowship with him, is the gift of koinonia with him. You know, it's the secret place that you can have. What a beautiful thing the Lord would say, the secret place where the Father sees you doing secret. So I want to call this out right now. I want to call out today in the message. Beloved, we've got to repent and turn away from the sin of prayerlessness. We've got to, we've got to be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves, have any of us become comfortable by being prayerless? You know, we just and when I say prayerless, I'm not saying that we don't say prayers. And I'm going to call that out too. Because just saying prayers is, is not God's will. You know, God knows our hearts. He told the prophet Samuel, man looks at the outward. You know, man hears the vocals, uh, you know, but God sees the heart. You know, just praying the five-minute prayers, you know, we have time to do all the other things. Um, but just five-minute prayers or just praying on the way to work or just praying, uh, you know, just at the signal or just, you know, there's this whole flippant attitude towards the Lord and no beloved we've got to be a prayerful people so I, I want to call this out today God and, and ask God to help us to repent of this and turn to him because his grace is sufficient for us his grace abounds over us so that he would truly cleanse his people you know when Jesus did that when he came into the temple he drove out everybody and everything that had occupied the place that was meant for prayer. Interestingly, it was the court of the Gentiles. The court that was the place in the temple that was meant for us, the Gentiles. That these Jewish tax collectors and money lenders and traders and merchandisers had come and occupied that place and created a mess over there. Jesus drove them out. And what did he say? My house of prayer. Standing in the court of the Gentiles, he said, my house of prayer. My house, my house, my house shall be called as a house of prayer unto all nations. Jesus declared that prophetically for us. And so what is God's will for us who Gentiles who have God grafted into the kingdom of God? That we should be a people of prayer. That we should be houses of prayer. God's will for us is sweet and secret communion with him. Um, God's will for us is asking to receive answers that your joy would be filled. I want to ask you, do you really believe that when you ask, God hears? Do you really believe that when you ask, he will answer? God does, beloved. He wanting you to ask so that you will have the joy of seeing him answer your prayers. God's will for us is that we would pray earnestly for justice and restoration for ourselves and in this land. You know, there are things that your family has experienced breakdown because of, because of curses and because of all that the enemy had done against your family. But it's God's will to restore it's God's will to heal this land. It's God's will to heal your, your relatives. It's God's will for, he, to, for, for him to heal your, your community. You know, you are, you are a blessing and God wants to release that blessing through you and especially through your prayers as you take the posture of an intercessor and the place of an intercessor. So humbling ourselves as his people and calling out to him so that he would heal and bless our land. Pray and see the salvation of the Lord in our families and our anoikos. That is God's will for us. That we would pray and we would see the salvation of the Lord in our families and in our cause. I want to say this very clearly, beloved. God wants to save your family. God wants to save your oikos. God wants to touch your relatives. It, it don't settle for anything less than that. But your prayers have a big, big place in that. Don't be casual. You know how serious and how earnest you are for the salvation of your loved ones is seen in how much you pray for them and how you pray for them. But it's God's will that they be saved. So here's the point now. Who stops us from praying? Why? do people so often and why do so many people struggle with praying if god has promised so much bible teachers tell us you know about 4000 promises in the bible 4000 promises in the bible you tell me for who is it it's for us the covenant children 4000 promises but why is it that we don't ask 
why is it that we don't seek him? Why is it that we have time for everything else, but we don't have time to pray? I want to say something that's probably going to poke you, but it's okay. Birthday parties, we all show up. Wedding receptions, we all show up. You know, whatever it is, we'll make the time, we'll leave early from work, we'll tell our boss, I have a function to attend, whatever, whatever, take an Uber, go from one end of the city to the other end of the city. But we're there for all the fun gatherings. Why don't we come for prayer meetings? Why do we not come for worship nights? Why do we not make the effort? That time we're not busy. I may say, Shannon, you know, you're being a little legalistic. I'm willing to take that risk to sound legalistic, but I know I'm not being legalistic. Beloved, some things have to be spoken. Even if you cannot come from one place to another place, can you, can you gather together amongst yourselves? Who would stop us from being a praying people? And beloved, it's time that we understand there is so much that God wants to do through our church family. There's so much that God wants to do through our community. If we would appropriate his grace to say, God, I want to be a man and a woman of prayer. God, I want our family to be a family of prayer. Devotions are to be central. We want to be worshipful. We want to read your word. God, we want itself to be a, a, a church of prayer. Beloved, the greatest sin, I believe, is the sin of prayerlessness. And we ourselves kill our prayer life or stop ourselves from praying. And the reason for prayerlessness is all of the sinfulness of the flesh that manifests in various ways. For example, you know, let's, let's, how does the sinfulness of the old nature, how does the sinfulness that sometimes comes up again and again, you know, so often actually, not even sometimes, you know, how does it manifest itself? I've just listed out a few, it's not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the primary things that hinder our prayer life, that stop us from praying or stop us or stunt our growth in growing in prayer. First and foremost is, this, is the issue of the sin of unbelief. The book of Hebrews says, I want to read scripture, join me. I hope you got your Bibles with you in print or on your phone. The book of Hebrews, please open your Bibles. The book of Hebrews chapter 3 and 17 to 19. It speaks about the people of Israel in the wilderness. The book of Hebrews chapter 17 to 19. You know, the, one, of, one, one of the first things that stop us from being um, a prayerful people is the issue of unbelief, you know. 3, 17 to 19. Hebrews 3. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Verse 18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Interesting. They would not enter his rest. Those who were disobedient. Why were they disobedient? Verse 19. So we see that they were not able to enter the rest because of unbelief. Unbelief is a dangerous state or condition of the heart that keeps us away from God. And I'm not talking about those doubts that come and we struggle, we are trying to pursue God, we're trying to appropriate His promises and those struggle with doubts come. No, I'm not talking about that. That's a part of the Christian life and God helps us to overcome those, those doubts and deal with it. Many of us understand that. But I'm talking about a state of the heart, a, a unchanging you know, state of the heart where you know there's this whole hardening of the heart that has happened, which has made the hearts insensitive to God and say, and you know, there is unbelief. We know it, but we don't believe it. We know the Bible, but we don't believe the Bible. We know the word, we don't believe the word. And that keeps us away from God. That keeps us away from becoming a prayerful people. Unbelief, the sin of unbelief blocks us from becoming a prayerful people. Secondly, pride, as I mentioned at the last time. The book of Hebrews, I want to read it. Chapter 4, 6 to 8. The book of Hebrews, chapter 4, 6 to 8. Let's read it again as we did last time. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is opposed. He actively opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Pride. You know, so many times, 
you know, I, and in this, you know, when it comes to unbelief or pride, we need, that's the reason it's so important to be in true, genuine, uh, you know, fellowship, having godly friends who will identify this for us. And some of us have learned the art of living life solo, or at least we hang out with people uh, who will not call this out, who will not be able to recognize this because, you know, they either they themselves are cold and they're not walking with God or we people with, you know, we got to love unbelievers. We got to love the unsaved, reach out to them, but we don't got to allow them to influence us. They cannot be a voice in our life. And pride, you know, so many people live in pride. It, it's something that we got to deal with often. We got to deal with every day in a way. But the whole issue of, you know, I don't need God. How does pride show? I don't need God. I, the fact that we are comfortable, that are people comfortable, if somebody is comfortable living every day without praying, living every day without asking God for his grace, without asking God for his wisdom, that is the clearest evidence of pride. God, I can live my life the way I want to. I can handle this. I can handle my family. I can handle my job. I can do what I want to do. The worst thing, if you're in ministry, I can even do ministry without praying. I mean, that's terrible. And, and so where are we heading with this? And this is the clearest evidence of, of pride. And therefore, pride stops people from praying because pride makes us independent. It is prayer that is humbling and fasting even more. You know, it is prayer that says, God, I can do a lot of things, but it will amount to nothing, God. My life will have no fruit that is of eternal value. I may have success. I may have worldly success. I may make a lot of money. I may, be, I may take off in my career. But God, I will not have eternal fruit. I will not have your touch upon my life. I want your touch upon everything. I want my family to be marked by your presence. I want us as a couple. I want us as a family to be marked by your presence, the cloud of glory by day, the pillar of fire by night. I want your presence to be like a wall of fire. I want in everything, in every detail of my life, I want us to, uh, I want us to display Christ. I, I want our house to carry your presence. I want our house to be a house of prayer. I want us to have fruit that will only come from abiding in you, changing lives, our own lives changing, and us facilitating the change in the other people's lives. God is only possible if we abide in you by prayer and by your word. Laziness, that's the third issue, this, the sin of laziness, spiritual lethargy. You know, the excitement to do everything that's fun and that's entertaining but the moment it comes to prayer, it comes to the things of God, that is an evidence of spiritual laziness, spiritual lethargy. The moment you talk about going for a movie, the moment you talk about a party, the moment you talk about going for an outing, it's all excitement. The moment it shifts into somebody just say, let's just pray, let's take time to worship, let's take time to worship. That's an evidence. You see, Shani, you're being judgmental. Yes, I'm being judgmental. A people who are not excited about praying, a people who are not excited about getting get in the, the things of God, you know, something is surely wrong and somebody has to tell you about it. It's, it's better that I tell you and make you uncomfortable. It's, it's okay that you're uncomfortable with me, but it's not good that the Lord would say something to you on that day when it's irreversible, the consequences for eternity. So, beloved, do we hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God, for the things of God? And let's connect with the next two things I want to mention. The lack of focus and discipline. You know, Paul, when he was talking to Timothy, he, he uses words that we normally don't like to associate with the Christian life. Because when it comes to matters of faith and spirituality, he says, man, take it easy, you know. Uh, but of course, when it comes to career and when it comes to studies and comes to education, man, the money is involved, right? We want the money to come in, right? Because we want to have a good life. And because we want to have a good life, we want to make sure that we work very hard. We want to work very hard. But you know what Paul was saying? Paul told Timothy, he says, verse 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4.15. He says, take pains with these things. Take pains to grow spiritually. You look at the previous verses, he actually talks about how, you know, that poor Timothy should be an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. And he says, you've got to be an example to the believers. And he, he tells them certain things to do. He says, do not neglect the spiritual gift that is in you. You know, give attention to public reading of scripture and basically saying, grow as a disciple of Jesus. Grow as a servant of God. Grow as a leader of God. But how are you going to grow? Verse 15, 1 Timothy 4, 15. Take pains with these things. Do we associate that with spirituality? Take pains. Take pains to get up early. You know, spend time with God. Study the word. 
take pains. And beloved, I've, I've worked in the corporate. I worked in the corporate for seven years. I wasn't in the easy. It was intense. I was in a highly intense, demanding job. But even in that time, by the grace of God, and yet not Shannon, but by the grace of God, God helped me to appropriate his grace so that I kept growing. I did not compromise on my spiritual disciplines. I did not compromise on my commitment to church. I did not compromise not only in commitment to church, but to the work of the ministry. I was leading a house church that was fruitful. We started with three people, grew in two years to about 35 people, was growing. God helped me to lead the worship team. I've lived corporate, demanding job. But I, God helped me not to compromise. And so let's not make excuses that, you know, I've got this to do, that to do. Everybody's got stuff to do. But if you're going to do it at the cost of your spiritual life, the life of God is not going to flow into various aspects of your life, beloved. So how are you going to grow? You got to take pains. It's not going to be easy. Take pains with these things, Paul is telling Timothy. Be absorbed in them. Look at the language used. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Beloved, lack of focus and discipline. In another place, Paul tells Timothy, you got to discipline yourself. You know, he talks about in the second Timothy, he talks about hardship. He talks about, you know, being diligent to present yourself approved to God. So the whole point is that we've got to work hard to grow spiritually. We've got to work hard. Prayer is hard work. Fasting is difficult, you know. But even as we do that, the reward is far more immense it's beautiful or we or we or, or so we got to look at these things and say god i have i accommodated these things in my life one more beloved and this is this is important this is sensitive but i'm going to ask god to give me the grace to say this wisely but he has to say it as it needs to be said and that is distractions natural and spirit and sinful it's easy to identify the sinful distractions right you know stuff that is clearly sinful right um, that is blocking our relationship with God, you know. But what about things that seemingly appear good? You know, the in fact, the very blessings of God. Some of, some of the things that some of our greatest issues are in growing spiritually are not the, the clearly the bad things, but the good things that have been positioned by us in our lives in such a way that it has now become bad. Okay. What is the great, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is John Piper. What is the greatest threat to your soul? Whatever keeps you from God. And not every threat will be a sin to your spiritual life. In fact, for many of us, perhaps most of us, the greatest threats to our souls are not sin, but some good gift God himself has given us. Here's what John Piper offers a perceptive warning. He says that the greatest enemy of hunger for God is not poison, but apple pie. It's not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but endless nibbling at the table of the world. It is not the X-rated video, but the prime time dribble of triviality we drink in every night. So here's the point. What is the greatest threat to your spiritual hunger, to your prayer life? It is whatever keeps you from God. Whatever keeps you from God. Come with me to Luke Luke 14, 16 to 26. Luke 14, 16 to 26. Some of you understand and remember that, you know, Jesus wants to commune with you. Jesus wants to fellowship with you. He wants to invite you to a, to a banquet. He wants to invite you in a table that he's prepared for you, where he wants to fill you and feed you and fill you with good things. He wants to anoint your head with oil and make your cup overflow. He wants to fill you with blessings. He wants to bless you in a way that only he could bless you. Only he can fill your life with the sweetness of his love and his presence and feed you with the manna of his word. And so it's a banquet that Jesus prepared, you know. And so one of the greatest gifts of our salvation, like I said earlier, is a communion with the Lord. It is the Lord himself. It is not merely to be saved from your sins. That is the beginning, us being saved from our sins. Uh, receiving a new birth, you know, being born again by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God, and receiving a new identity, our worth in Christ, our acceptance in Christ. For what? So that we could sit at His table. You know, it's it's when you look at that passage in Revelation. I'm coming. Stay with me with Luke 14, please. But in the passage of Revelation, Jesus is actually outside the door of a church, and He's actually knocking on the door of the church. and says, "If you allow me to come in, imagine the church put Him out. They're doing church without Jesus." They're doing all stuff without Jesus or probably not even doing anything. 
And Jesus is saying that if you, and behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens to me, I will come in and dine with him. Jesus wants to fellowship with you. Look at what happened over here in Luke 14. You know, um, Jesus is saying about a parable in Luke 14. And he says, there's been an invitation. Invitation to come. And we see um, that people begin to reject the invitation. Excuses. Excuses. Luke 14, 16 onwards. Stay with me. Come on, let's read it together. But he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner and invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent a slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything. Come for everything is ready now. Verse 18. But they all alive began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I've bought a piece of land, business, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Why would you buy a land and then go to look at it? Wouldn't you look at the land before you buy it? Excuse. Verse 19, another one said, I've bought, I have already bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Why would you try out oxen after you've bought it? Wouldn't you try them out before you buy it? Verse 20, another one said, I've married a wife. I'm glad it doesn't say that. I'm going to see her now. But for that reason, I cannot come. I married a wife. For that reason, I cannot come. You know, the point is this, beloved, that you, we look at, you know, the things that are mentioned over here. Is buying a land, is land evil? No, it is not. Is business evil? No. In fact, we believe in kingdom entrepreneurship. You know, doing everything for the good. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be blessed in your workplace. And he wants you to be a blessing. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to have upward mobility in your place of work. God wants you to excel in your workplace. In fact, the scripture is very clear on that. I don't want to clarify that right now. If you're a good Bible student, you know that. My issue is that if your work is going to be an excuse for prayerlessness, if your work and your business is going to be an excuse for you to stay away from the banqueting table of the Lord, a table that he prepared for you by shedding his blood for you, beloved. I need to call that out. Verse, verse 19, I've got five yoke of oxen. Are you involved in trading? Are you involved in commerce? Are you involved in things that are becoming excuses for you? You know, God's blessed you. There was a time when you didn't have much and you had time for God. Now God's blessed you and you don't have time for it. Family, verse 20. Another one said, I'm married, uh, I've married a wife and for that reason, I cannot come. I want to say this, beloved. You know, we can only love our family well in the end when we love them for his sake. If our spouse or kids or parents or friends consume our lives, people are, you know, some parents, you're obsessed with your children. You're obsessed with, you know, you don't have time for God. You're so obsessed. Your whole life, your children have become your idol. Your spouse has become your idol. You know, whether it's your husband or your wife. You know, I would say this. We can love our family well in the end when we love them for his sake. If our spouse or kids or parents or friends consume our lives consciously and unconsciously, they rob us of what we need to love them well. Do you know something? When you grow in God, you will love them in a way that will bring them life and blessing that only God can pour out through your life when you abide in him. At the end of, when the end of life and in all eternity, what will matter is not how much money you left for your kids. Or what kind of lifestyle you provided for your family, your brand of clothes, the, the kind of school they went to, what cars you dropped them. You know, I want to say it very clearly. Your lifestyle will not matter for eternity, but it is the spiritual inheritance that you'll give them. Like what the grandmother and mother deposited in Timothy. The greatest gift that you can give your family is your godliness is your spiritual inheritance, is, is the treasures of the understanding of God's word. Beloved, your money will not keep your children safe in the world. It is godliness that will keep them safe in the world. What's going to keep your marriage strong together is both of you abiding in Christ, not a hefty bank balance, not a great house. And I'm not saying that any of these things are bad. I'm not being sarcastic. Praise God, if you have been blessed to have a good house, if you have had good things of life, I'm happy. God bless you. I mean it. God bless you. But don't let the good things become evil by you allowing them to become idols in your life. Don't be so consumed by things. You will love your family well when you become a man of God, when you become a man after God's own heart. If you're a man who gets up early in the morning and prays and weeps for your wife and your children, blessed is your family because you are, you're a praying husband. You're a praying father. I want to say this. Your children are blessed. If, you're, if, if the parents have a godly and a loving marriage, 
don't let love uh, you, <clears throat> don't let your loved ones be an excuse to neglect your love from above. So I want to say this, beloved, that I, why am I calling out these things? Why am I saying it for what it is? Is is not to bring condemnation. I know well enough today that condemnation does not result in godliness. But sometimes you have to say it out, say it out so that the Holy Spirit can use this in order to, in a good way, make us uncomfortable, unsettle us from where we have become comfortable, push us off the couch, push us off the boat, get us into a better place so that we say, God, yes, I've been like this. I have given place for these things. I have fallen into the terrible, terrible sin of prayerlessness. I've tried to provide all the material things. I've been sincere. I've, I've really sincerely worked hard to provide for my family. But the point is that, God, I have not worked hard enough to grow spiritually, which would have been the greatest inheritance, the greatest richness I could have given them. And so, beloved, I, I want to request you this morning that we would identify, acknowledge the sin of prayerlessness, and we would return back to God and ask him to make us a, a prayerful people, beloved. Beloved, we can start that today. It's not a long walk. It's not a long road. It can happen this very moment. As right now, if I'm speaking to you and you're saying, yeah, Shan, this is for me. This is who I've been. You are not condemned. You are loved by God. That is why God is speaking to you. Because if God was in, God hated you and me, he would be indifferent to you like he was indifferent to Esau. But he's wrestling with you right now in your heart and saying, son, I have so much for you, but I cannot give it to you because you're not coming in that place where I could pour into your heart and life. My daughter, there's so much I want to do through your life. There's a beauty that I can give you that cannot be given by anybody else or anything else. I want to manifest my beauty in you and through you. But it's only going to happen when you come into the secret place. So beloved, I want to encourage us and request us that we would, we would humble ourselves. We would be honest and we would ask God to help us to grow in our prayers, to become a prayerful people. So uh, would you this morning join with me and acknowledge that you and I need God? You know, if, 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 you, if you are that person right now, the Holy Spirit is, is speaking to you right now. You're saying, Shannon, yeah. My temple needs to be cleaned. Jesus needs to come and whack things out of my life. He has to cleanse this temple so that my house, my life, my family will be a house of purity so that it can become a house of the power of God. It can become a house of prayer. It become, I, when all these things are removed and put in its right place, sinful things have to be completely removed. Good things have to be arranged and placed in its right place, whether it's family, spouse, children, you know, work. It has to be put in as the right arrangement. The picture I get is of uh, the solar system, the sun, and everything has its right orbit, right? You know, what if Jupiter came in the front and Mercury went behind? What if the Earth went from being the third planet to the first planet? <laughs> you cannot even imagine, right? Let the sun be at the center. Let Jesus be at the center of our lives and let everything come in the right orbit. And when everything in your life is at the right orbit, where the Lord is the center of it all, and he is our all in all, his light, his life shines in everything because you're abiding in him. When anything comes in the right orbit, beloved, you will experience wholeness. You will experience um, a blessing of the Lord that makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. But if, if things are gone out of orbit, if things have become a mess spiritually, you, you know, this is the time you say, Lord, I want to be honest with you. You know, one of the greatest things that the Lord values about a good heart, a heart with a good soil, is honesty. Saying, being truthful. Lord, I don't want to make excuses. I don't want to justify. I've not been a man of prayer. I've not been a woman of prayer. I've not been a praying husband. I've not been a praying wife. I've not been an employee in my workplace who's prayed for my workplace. God, I've not been praying for my oikos. God, I've not been praying for my city and my nation. God, I've not prayed for our church. I've not been praying for our church. God, I've not been praying for our life group. I've not been praying for our leaders. You know, Lord, help me. I want to be a prayerful person. I want you to help me to begin to pray. Firstly, to find my sweet communion with you. And as I find that intimacy, the joy of intimacy and sweet communion with you, you will also lay upon me the burden and the responsibility to pray for my loved ones, to pray for the various areas and aspects of my life, my workplace, my relationships, my oikos, my ministry, 
the church, the city, the nation. And it's possible. I can share with you this week a, a, a weekly prayer schedule that can help you in six days to cover every area and aspect of your life without compromising on your personal intimacy with God. So God wants you to be a worshiper, but he also wants you to be an intercessor, both. Worship leads to intim intimacy, intercessor and leads to his kingdom coming in through our lives. So we need to be worshipful. We need to be worshipers, but we also need to be intercessors. You know, that's the great in a ministry that Jesus is still doing at the right hand of the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father, he is interceding for us to so join in the ministry of Jesus. And so I can send you a prayer schedule, but it begins with at this moment saying, Shannon, I agree. I acknowledge I've not been right with God. I've got either, either I've been involved in sinful things or I've taken good things and made it sinful because of wrongly placing in my life. I've made an idol out of my spouse or my children, or I made my work an idol. I've had time for everything else, yeah, and, but I've not had time for the things of God. And I want to request you this morning, let there be a returning back to God. For he is slow to anger. The Lord is great in compassion because the Lord is good to all. The Lord is good to all who call upon him, who call upon him in truth in sincerity. God is in your heart, beloved, this, this time. And you're saying, Lord, I, I want to be a man of prayer. I want to be a woman of prayer. This time, why don't you join with me? Why don't you just, if possible, if you think you're okay to do so, kneel down where you are. If you think you're okay to just bow your head, otherwise close your eyes, lift your hands to God and invite him to come and help you. Acknowledge the condition of your heart, the condition of your life, the condition of your spiritual spiritual play position just acknowledge to us keep your words few you, you will not be heard by your many words but you will be heard because you you are sincere acknowledge to him where you are one of the most powerful prayers is help me lord for he is the helper the holy spirit you know the book of romans chapter 8 26 says the holy spirit helps us in our weaknesses the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. That's one of his biggest um, responsibilities or ministries abiding in us. He helps us. Would you ask him to help you? Would you ask him to put away things that are sinful, to repent of it, to turn away, to throw those things, to reject it, to hate those things with a holy hatred because you, because you love God? And would you ask his help in order to place the gifts and the blessings that he's given you, beginning with your family, beginning with your loved ones, your work, your hobbies, your, your activities, they're all meaningful. They are good, but they must come in its right orbit, beloved. Let Jesus be the center. Let the Lord, let the Adonai, let our Adonai, and our Redeemer, our King be the center. Let him not just be the center of, of our lives, but let him be the center of everything in our lives. Surrender in the Christian life is not giving up things. I've said this many times. Surrender in the Christian life is not giving up on things. Asceticism is unbiblical. It is in fact demonic. Surrender in the Christian life is giving in to Jesus. Is surrendering, is inviting his lordship and kingship in our marriage, in our parenting, in our finances, in our workplace, in our careers, in our ministries. In every aspect, even in our gymming, even in our workout, even in our sports, even in our weekend outdoors, inviting Jesus in everything so that he will be our all in all, so that his life, his love, his presence will flow in everything, so that everything becomes meaningful and purposeful and beautiful. You will find God encountering you in amazing ways. <laughs> you know, you will get constantly surprised. As you abide in Jesus, he will just, he's got good gifts for us every day, for his mercies on you every morning. He's prepared his banqueting table for you. He has richly laid it out for you. There's a rich spread for you of his presence, of his word, of his blessings, of his promises that he wants to fulfill in your life. Come to the table of the Lord. Come into your secret place. Come and ask God to help you, beloved. So Lord, we want to thank you, God, for this precious morning. And God, I know that I've said some very weighty and pointed things, but I've said so trusting in your grace. I've said, through, said so knowing, trusting and knowing that this is your will, God, that you will make each of us, every man a praying man, every woman a praying woman, 
a child, children would be praying children. The children came to you and they praised you, God. Then our children would be worshipful. Our children would love your word. Our children would be excited about things of the kingdom and not the nonsense that's there in the world and the triviality of worldliness. Lord, that our homes would be houses of prayer. Our families would be soaked in your presence. Lord, everything would be due, would, ex- would have your touch on it, God. And so we pray that there would be a shift today, a returning to you, a moving towards you to be men and women of prayer, that we would even come to a place of decision as to when we're going to pray every day, that we would take time and we would ask your help to guard that time, keep our phones away, keep distractions away, wake up early if we need to, stay up late, take our time in the afternoon if we get that time. Lord, whatever we can do to carve out time during the day, maybe at one time or in parts, that you would enable us to enjoy sweet communion with you, that you would enable us to be worshipful, prayerful, and even intercessory. For you taught us, Lord, that our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, hallowed be your name, be hallowed in our lives, be hallowed in every area and aspect of our life, but also that your kingdom would come and your will would be done that you would give us our daily bread, our provision for our lives, for our families, for every Indian aspect of our life. We need your mana. We need your daily bread. We need your wisdom. We need good knowledge, understanding. We need your anointing. We need your power. We need what only you can give us so that we could see your glory manifested in our lives and that you would protect us from the evil one. You protect us from temptations, sinful temptations, that we would not yield to the flesh, we would not yield to the things of the world. We would not agree with the enemy, but we would we would live overcoming lives. And God, so that truly yours would be the glory and the honor and the power forever and ever. So God, make what's up a house of prayer. Make all our churches, I pray for each and all of our churches, our English church, each of our Hindi churches, each of our outstation churches would become houses of prayer. Our life groups would be houses of prayer. Our friendships would be soaked. Our fellowship would be soaked in prayer, God. That we would be prayerful in everything so that Christ would truly be our all in all. Oh God, we want to be people who rejoice and delight at what you've prepared at your banqueting table for us. We want to forsake the sin of prayerlessness and become men and women of prayer your covenant people, for you are our God and we are your people. We want to thank you, God. Bless us, God. Bless this week. Bless our families. Be glorified increasingly. We pray this in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. I believe the Lord has spoken to you and that you would not do the fatal mistake of taking this lightly but by the help of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, you respond to this wholeheartedly. And we will be in touch next Sunday, March 19th, is the physical gathering back at Warsaw Welfare. We've also announced about Pastor Nikki Raibori's meeting. Uh, the venue was not mentioned. Um, it is at Ryan Global School, which is at Lokhandwala, Andiri West. So you can uh, give your numbers to the pastors and we can collect all the names and give it to you. There's no registration fee. It's free. Pastor Nikki Raibori. So join us uh, this Friday evening and Saturday morning. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. God bless you. Please keep me and my family in prayer. Keep one another in prayer. The Lord bless you.